We're only a few days away from the great American eclipse of 2024. I believe something big is going to happen in the natural and in the spiritual during those four and a half minutes. Why are so many emergency declarations happening? Let's talk about it tonight on the Big Picture Live Bible Study. Oh yeah, it is the Big Picture Live Bible Study, and we are here tonight talking about everything that's going on. And if you were aware of what was happening uh, this past weekend, of course, this past weekend around the world was none other than the Resurrection Sunday, the Super Bowl of all holidays for the Christian, and that is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Um, but if you'll remember, just a quick review, uh, the President of the United States on Sunday proclaimed it to be transgender. By the way, thank you for that super chat, Bravo Mike. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Declared that it was Transgender Day of Visibility. He also declared that it was Cesar Chavez Day. That it was American Heritage Month, month beginning, and it was nine other proclamations. And of all those proclamations, not one single mention of the resurrection, not one single mention of even the name Easter. Uh, oh, and by the way, a memo went out this past weekend that was sent to all the parents of the children that would be, would be attending the annual Easter egg roll to not decorate any eggs with any religious symbols on them. Oh, but this was... This was no big deal, right? New York. Oh, wait a minute. No, it wasn't all. New York Governor uh, Hochul declared that all state landmarks this past weekend on Sunday morning, you know, you know, Resurrection Day, would light up in pink, white, and light blue on Easter Sunday to celebrate Transgender Day of Visibility. Now, why am I telling you all that? I want to remind you that all of this came down in the middle of something called Passion Week. It is the week that we lead up to um, Good Friday, which is, of course, this past Friday. And then Saturday, the day before uh, what is known as our Holy Day, which is, of course, um, Resurrection Day, Sunday, that Saturday is known as the Day of Silence. And, and you know, you think about it in politics, that's what they like to do. They like to drop uh, the bombs right on Friday evening or Saturday when nobody's talking, no, everybody's out with family. But it was very interesting that this year in Passion Week, this day of silence, which is Saturday, uh, was when all of these proclamations dropped. And I believe that it was on purpose. I believe that it was dropped on, uh, on that day of silence, thinking that the Christians would not pay attention. The difference is we live in a world now where, you know, there's some people that's waking up, y'all. That's why we call it the big picture. There's some people that's seeing the big picture here, and they're waking up to what is really, really going on. So in that day of silence on Passion Week, they dropped this. Uh, and, and I believe that it was very strategic because I think they know they're running out of time. Uh, and, and I think they were just trying to fear monger, too, because if you think about it, uh, and I reported on this. I, re I just released it, said, hey, I hope, I hope this guy's wrong. But I released this uh, very well-connected uh, guy, made a reel, that was saying that the FBI had just dropped that the terrorist level was at the highest that it's ever been in the history of regulating and, and watching the terrorist level and was warning against terrorist attacks on Easter Sunday. Now, I haven't heard of any major attacks. Maybe, maybe it was uh, a false flag. Maybe it was the fact that the information got out. Uh, the people that were planning these things were not able to do it. But there is a very, very strategic attack happening right now, planning an, a strategic attack, I believe, in the physical and in the spiritual. Now, I believe something big is coming. I really do believe that. And and uh, I know what people are thinking. They're like, here he goes again. He's always talking about something big is coming. Something. Well, you know, there is something big coming. The Bible prophesies that there will be a generation that is the final generation. Hebrews chapter 12 says everything that can be shaken will be shaken until that which cannot be shaken remains. Well, there's a shaking going on. There's a whole lot of shaking going on. And something big is coming. Now, I believe that is very important for us to look at this opening scripture because this is Bible study. All right. So let's just remind ourselves that this is Bible study. 
And I want to show you something here uh, in the Word of God. In Genesis chapter 1, let me shrink this down. I, like I said, i got all kinds of things going on, y'all. If y'all just knew what I had to deal with sometimes on, on, this, on this internet here. And the devil is a lie. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons. For signs and for seasons. Now, and for days and for years. Now, so before he ever declares them to be for light, uh, he declares that the sun and the moon and the stars are here for uh, signs. And that's huge to us because we've got a big sign coming. There's a big, big sign coming Monday, okay, in the United States of America. It's called the Great American Eclipse. Y'all, it's going to be mind-boggling. If you were blessed, my family was blessed to travel to Georgia. I live in Alabama. We traveled over to Georgia. It was a short trip, but we were there for the last uh, great eclipse in 2017. And you, if you saw it, then you understand there's no way to describe this sign that is in the heavens. You can, you can watch it on video. You can, you can watch replays of it, but you, it doesn't do it justice. Well, we saw it, and it was, it was, a, it was a physical sign in the heavens. Well, we were not expecting this to happen, what happened. When that physical sign happened, when the moon passed in front of the sun and the total eclipse happened, which is known as totality, it lasted for about a minute and a half last time, seven years ago. This was going to be four and a half minutes for a lot of people. That's in the direct line of totality. But for a minute and a half, it was a spiritual moment. You could feel not only did you feel the temperature instantly change, 10 to 12 degrees, I mean, just like that, which was weird. And all of a sudden, there was this gray, I don't know how, how to describe the look. Everything looked weird. It got dark. All the lights, the auto lights came on. The cricket started and the, the insects started making noise. I'm talking about instantly. It threw everything. It threw creation off because they, they were not expecting that. But... uh. It, it was a spiritual experience. I saw people falling on their knees. I, I saw people weeping. I saw people crying. I saw people, thank you for that super sticker, Julie. What a blessing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're awesome. What a blessing. But I, but I saw, it was a spiritual thing. It was a sign in the heavens, but it was a spiritual thing that happened. And I believe that that is what's going to happen on another level, y'all. I believe that we're about to see something Monday that is a physical sign that is a that will be seen by millions of people with their with their own the, the naked eye when when totality happens you can take those special glasses glasses off and you can look straight at the sun it's incredible uh with, without those glasses now i've heard some people say four and a half minutes is too long to be looking at it even though it's totality we'll leave that to the experts and you can research that for yourself but it's mind-boggling. But I believe something's going to shift. Now, now I'm going to get I'm going to get into the word of God in just a minute. Uh back into the word of God. But I want to tell you, think about all the proclamations, the emergency declarations that are happening along the swath of this eclipse. Y'all, they're telling us, they're continuously telling us that this is because they're not used to crowds like the crowds that are going to be coming in. Oh yeah, there's going to be crowds. There's no doubt about it. There's going to be crowds and overwhelming. The, the roads are going to be overwhelmed. I get that. But that happens in some of these larger cities for Super Bowls, for major events. But there's hardly ever an emergency declaration charge. And, and then on top of that, part of the emergency declaration is telling people to have enough food to last for two weeks, water for two weeks. Make sure you have gas in your, in your vehicle. Make sure you have batteries in your flashlight. In case of cell phone coverage going down, in case of internet going down, they're having all these things that are saying, have a backup plan. Y'all, they're, they're expecting something. And then I want you to think about this. Millions of people are going to be out of their homes. Their guard is going to be down and they're all going to be looking up. And, and let me tell you, if you have um, really bad motives and you're here on assignment to do something bad, that would be a really good time. I'm not, I'm not look, I'm not, I'm not worried about saying that. I'm not giving uh, people ideas that if they were wanting to do harm, they wouldn't already thought about that. 
it is going to be um, a prime time to happen. So I'm thankful that the police are going to be alert. They're going to be more police. There's going to be National Guard in some places in case all that happens. But, but remember, before I'm a reporter of news, I'm a preacher of the gospel. And I want to tell you something. The signs that Genesis that we just read in the heavens and in the earth beneath are not signs necessarily to point us to the fact that there are more physical things coming, more earthquakes, more tsunamis, which, by the way, they're happening just as on this live recording last night, a horrible, tragic earthquake happened. I believe it was a 7.5. Is that right? Uh, right off the coast of Taiwan which has triggered tsunamis uh, and possibly tsunami warnings uh, up and up and down Japan. Uh, let's keep an eye on that. You know, and you know, I'm sorry. Thank you for that super chat, Lisa. Thank you. What a blessing. You're awesome, Lisa Marie. Thank you. Um, but now, look, here's, here's how my conspiracy mind goes now, okay, is guess what? It, we knew, we have reported here that Xi Ping, is that how you say his name, uh, from China, has it has been said that it is known that he wants to attack Taiwan somewhere in the March, April, May window. Well, we already know that they've annexed the China Sea. They just, on their own, just went ahead and went over Taiwan and said, we own the sea on the back of, of Taiwan, and now we just annexed Taiwan right back into, into our, uh, what we call the China Sea, into our international borders. Well, guess where the epicenter was? on the backside of Taiwan. And it's like it's affected Taiwan. It's the worst case scenario for Taiwan. If they're about to be attacked uh, and, you know, from China and China is now looking at it going, man, now this is the time to go because an earthquake has happened. Well, my conspiracy mind goes there that, you know, there are people that believe that Places like China, America, and other places have weapons, uh, frequency weapons, um, direct energy weapons that can trigger earthquakes. So was this was this something that was triggered as a as an opening door to this coming invasion in war? I don't know, but so so the title of tonight's message is. God is doing something big in the dark. So I believe that when that eclipse happens and darkness happens in that stretch, it's 115 miles wide and it's going to cover, it's going to come in America. It's going to start down in Mexico. It's going to come in America of all places. It's going to come in uh, at Eagle Pass, Texas, the very spot that is the hotbed that's been on the news for immigration and open borders. It's going to come in there. It's going to go all the way across the United States, up the East Coast, and then enter out. How, how amazing is this? It's literally going to be totality leaving Niagara Falls. Uh, Niagara Falls is in totality. And that's why New York has declared as a, an emergency in Niagara Falls, and so has Canada on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls and on the American side of Niagara Falls. So people are going to be able to stand there. Can you imagine how that's going to be? And if you are if you're watching and you got you get an opportunity to do that, let us know in the comment section how that was to stand at the at Niagara Falls and and hear the roar and, and feel the mist of that water in the middle of the day, and then all of a sudden everything goes dark and reflecting and hitting Niagara Falls is going to be a full solar eclipse, y'all. This is insane. This is this is just incredible. And then it's going to go out through uh, Nova Scotia as it exits out over land. And it's going to be incredible. It's an incredible sign in the heavens. But I want to tell you something. You know, we just came out of Resurrection Sunday. And then on that Saturday, when Jesus' body was laying in that tomb, uh, the Bible tells us, and I want, I want to show you something. Let's, let's, go, let's go to the Word of God here. And I'm going to tie this into everything that we're talking about tonight. The Word of God says, now the first day of the week, John chapter 20, verse 1, uh, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. 
Now I'm going to come back and, uh, and we'll go back to scripture in just a moment. But what I need you to know is this. Something happened in the dark in that tomb. Picture, picture this. You've heard about it all your life. There's this tomb, the tomb of Joseph of Arithmetia. The body of Jesus is laid into a borrowed tomb. It's not his. By the way, why do you want to pay for a tomb when you know you're only going to rent it for three days? Did it? Let's see if I can do my drums here. Nope, that's the wrong one. Sorry. I don't know where all my sound effects are. <laughs> that was not what I was looking for. I was looking for my rib shot. But uh, during that Saturday, when it seemed like everything was quiet, when it seemed like nothing was going on, in fact, the disciples were scared to death. They were hiding because they believed the same fate that happened to their leader was about to happen to them. In fact, the word was out, kill all Christians. So the only ones that were at the tomb during the dark was the soldiers and probably angels. But inside that tomb, I want you to picture something. Go inside that tomb in your mind. It's sealed. It's not just, it doesn't just have a stone rolled in front of it, but it is sealed with the seal of the Roman Empire. And, and that doesn't just mean there was just something stuck on it. There was something, there was a seal stuck on it. There was probably uh, types of wax or something poured over it so that they would have evidence that, would, that, that they saw it dry. So that if somebody tries to shift it and go in and steal the body, they would see evidence that someone had tried to push the stone. But I want you to think about it. By the time that Mary Magdalene got to the tomb, just around the time that the sun was coming up, she found that while it was still dark, she's, she's getting there at dark, right before the sun comes up, probably, probably the protocol was if the Roman soldiers were going to let her put the spices on the body so it wouldn't stink, they would probably have permission to remove the stone once it was light. She's waiting. She gets there early but she sees that the stone has been rolled away. That means in the middle of the night, in the darkness, inside that tomb, it was completely pitch black dark. Can you imagine? Couldn't see the hand in front of your face. But the body of Jesus was inside that dark tomb. But in the middle of the night, something happened in the darkness. What happened in the darkness? Now, I know you're going to automatically say, well, the stone was rolled away in the darkness, in the middle, in the darkness of the night. Well, yes. And of course, the angels probably rolled the stone away. But something else happened before the stone was rolled away. What was that? What I'm about to tell you is what happened before the stone was rolled away inside that tomb. Remember, his body laid in that tomb for three days. Now, on the outside of that tomb and on the inside of that tomb, it looked like nothing was happening. In fact, it looked like it was over. Everything they had believed Jesus was going to do, even though he told them this is how it was going to happen, it seemed that it was over. But I want you to know, even when it's dark, even when it's silent and even when nothing is moving like you think it ought to be moving, God is still working. God, let me, let me just say something to you. Can I just throw something at you right now? Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost. God actually does his best work in the dark. He does his best work in the dark, y'all. Why? Because let me tell you something about darkness. Darkness doesn't even exist. Darkness is not a thing. Do you understand? Scientists will tell you, darkness does not exist. You can't develop a, a machine to make darkness. You can develop a machine to create light. You can create a light bulb. You can create electricity, but you can't create darkness. Darkness is simply the absence of light, okay? You can have a room that's pitch black dark. Be in a cave, you know, 500 feet underground. There's no natural light, no man-made light. You're in complete darkness. Your flashlight goes out. You're panicking because it's as dark as a human being can comprehend darkness. And on the other side of that cave, somebody has an Apple watch that ain't dead yet, and it 
turns on, guess what? Automatically, every eye in that dark cave will go to that Apple Watch. Why? Because that little tiny light on that watch expels the darkness that's around it. The, this is how darkness leaves. Light shows up. Now, the Bible tells us that, that when we get to the new Jerusalem, oh, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, y'all. There'll be no need for the Son, for the Son of God himself will light the city. That's the glory of God. So everything in the natural was created in the natural to teach us spiritual principles. The Bible tells us first the natural, then the spiritual. That's why he says, I want you to be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. Well, he don't want you to be a tree, but he wants you to study the tree, study the root systems, study how it, if it's got strong roots and it's placed in a good, in a good place next to moving water, that it can survive droughts, it can, it can survive storms. And he wants us to be like that tree. Tells Nicodemus, you must be born again, basically like a baby. You, you got to learn how to walk spiritually. You got to learn how to crawl. You got to learn how to talk spiritually. So he takes the natural to teach us spiritual principles. When he looks at, we, we, we see the sun, we see the moon, we see the stars, and we know that Genesis chapter one said they were put up there as signs. But that also means they were put up there to teach us spiritual principles. Well, we have the S O N. Son of God that is greater than the natural S U N. So inside that tomb, it was completely dark. Now, boy, I'll tell you, I'm all over the place tonight. I'm, I, my notes all got messed up. Y'all stay with me. If you're still with me, give me a hand clap, give me a fist bump, give me something, smash that like button. If, if, you, if you're still with me, share, share, share. If you watch it on Facebook, watch it on Rumble, wherever you're at, give me some love. Let's rewind a little bit. Let me show you the pattern of God. I want to show you the pattern of what happened inside that tomb. And I believe this ties into what's about to happen in the spirit realm. And I truly believe ties into something that's about to happen on Monday during this eclipse in another way. But watch this. If you go back and study Jewish history and you go back and study not just the our Bible, but even the writings of the priests, the Talmud, and so forth, they will tell you that in the Old Testament, many priests have wrote this, that when they would go in once a year at Passover, and the high priest is the only one that was permitted to go in, would go in with his priestly garb on, and, and he would be dressed in his white linen, and he would have to have bells and pomegranates at the base of, of his garment, and they would tie a golden rope around his right leg, and they would lead that rope out into the inner court. And the, Levi, the Levitical priesthood would stand in the, in, the, in, the, in the middle court there and hold the rope. And as the priest was walking around during Passover with the blood of the lamb on the hyssop branch, slinging it towards the altar, <clears throat> excuse me, slinging it toward the altar for the sins of the people. It was in total black darkness. There was two, there was not just one curtain. One veil that separated the inner court from the Holy of Holies, it was two, and it was spanned between. Why? Because you had to pull the one curtain back, and then the priest would stand between the two curtains and wait for the first curtain to stop moving, because on the other side of that first curtain was, was uh, the menorah. There was the light, the man-made light the, that they had lit with, with, the, uh, with the candles. And there was, God would permit no man-made light to come into that darkness where he, what was called the Holy of Holies. So you'd have to stand and wait that no natural or man-made light would come past. You know, you, you know what I'm talking about? If you've got a curtain and, you, and that curtain is still swaying and it's, and it's a little bit of crack, a little bit of light can get through there. So he had to make sure that it was sealed. And once he verified that no light could come past that first veil, then he would reach over and pull back the second veil and walk into the Holy of Holies. And while he was in the Holy of Holies, slinging the blood upon the altar just uh, for the sins of the people, many priests wrote that they would begin to hear the sound of a man breathing faster and faster and faster coming in the room. <sighs> like he was running into the room. And then all of a sudden, the darkness of the Holy of Holies, pitch black darkness, no man-made light, no natural light, would illuminate to such a moment that the reason that rope was tied on the, on the high priest's leg, 
that if he did not come in pure, the glory of God that came in that Holy of Holies would strike him dead. And if the Levites did not hear the bells anymore, they would know that he had struck dead. Well, they could not go in and drag his body out or they would be killed. So they had to drag him out by that rope. Are y'all hearing me? That's the power of when God comes in that room. And he would come down and he would sit on the mercy seat on that Ark of the Covenant where the angel's wings touch, which was called the Ark, the mercy seat. And he would come in. You know, when, when Moses was on the mountain and he, and he just saw the backside of the glory of God, he had to put a veil on his face because it was so incredible. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this. God has a pattern of bringing his glory into total darkness. When no one else is around, it, he comes in and he transforms the situation. He would come into the Holy of Holies in pitch black darkness. And here we have the tomb. I want to show you something that's going to blow your mind. Oh, my goodness. Um, let's, let's, let's go back to the word of God here. Whew. I feel the Holy Ghost, y'all. I'm all stirred up tonight. My equipment's messed up, but the devil's a liar. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said, they have taken away our Lord out of the tomb. and We do not know where they have laid him. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter. So he stooping down, he looked, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths laying there and the handkerchief, King James Version says napkin, that had been laying around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in place by itself. <clears throat> then the other disciple who came in the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went away to their own homes. Now, a couple of things you got to hear that happened here. First of all, I want you to notice something. Mary Magdalene was the first one there. Now, this is John's telling of the story. Another gospel tells the story that Mary is in the garden and she passes a man who she thinks is the caretaker. Most of you know this story. She just passes right by him. She has no idea it's Jesus. Why does she not know it's Jesus? Mary Magdalene absolutely loved and adored Jesus. She knew what Jesus looked like. Some people have said, well, well because... You know, he, he wasn't bloodied up. He wasn't beat. She was not remembering Jesus that way. She remembered the Jesus that, that got her delivered from all the demons that she had. Why did she not recognize him? I want to show you that the word of God says she did not recognize him because he was dressed just like that priest that went into the Holy of Holies. He was dressed in white linen. The Bible tells us he is our priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And when he saw Mary, Go read it for yourself. Go get the Bible and read it for yourself and double check me. If and I dare you to check me because I don't preach it unless I know it's true. She, she walks by him. He doesn't recognize her. I mean, she doesn't recognize him. And then he stops and says, Mary. And when he says her name, she turns around and knows that it's him and takes off running towards him. Listen to the words that Jesus says. Jesus says to Mary, touch me not. Do not touch me. For I have not yet ascended to my father, but I ascend unto my father. Go and tell my disciples that I ascend unto my father, and I will come unto them in Jerusalem. Okay? That's what he said. That's what he said. Now, why is that important? That is important because it is a part of the Levitical priesthood that even the family of the priest could not touch the priest when he was taking his blood in. The book of Hebrews said that he entered in heaven once with his own blood for the sins of all mankind. Wow, glory to God. Are y'all hearing me? He entered into the Holy of Holies with his own blood. So there's not there wasn't just one ascension. There was two ascensions that's in Scripture. He, he could not be touched because why? From the time that he saw Mary, to the time that he walked through the wall into the room and revealed himself to his disciples and told Thomas, you know, stuck his hand in his side, you know, yeah, it's me, it's me. From that time to the, to the to time they were seen in that room, 
He went into the Holy of Holies, just like the priest in the Old Testament. And he took his blood and he purged the sins. And that blood is still there today. That's why we can plead the blood of Jesus. That's why we can still claim the power of the blood of Jesus, because it does not decay in heaven. And when the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Why? Because when the enemy comes and accuses us of our past, when we are washed in the blood, the blood is still fresh as if it was the day that he took it there. Okay, one day I believe we're going to see that. We're going to be able to see the actual blood of Jesus because it's not in a sin-cursed place. Now, all that being said, all that being said, <laughs> if I digress, whoo, Yeah, the question here, then why does he offer him to touch? Why did he say, Thomas, touch me now? Because when he came back in the room, he wasn't the high priest anymore. He was dressed like he was normally. Good question. Good question. He said, you can touch me now. It wasn't because she was a woman. It was because he had already completed the task of the high priest and taken his blood. When he walked back in, he was not dressed in the priestly garb. He was Jesus. He showed himself by many infallible priests for 40 days. He didn't walk around looking like a priest for 40 days. He walked around looking like Jesus for 40 days. I'm glad you asked that question. So it's not like, it, it, some people say, well, it's because he, she was a woman. She was a woman. No, that's a bunch of malarkey. Because if that was the case, the gospel is the good news. The power of the story of the resurrection is the good news. If Jesus did not want a woman to be the one that told that he, the world that he was alive, he would not have called her name. He would have just let her walk on by. But he knew the moment he said Mary, she would know it was him. So it had nothing to do with the fact that she was a woman. Are y'all still with me? Now, let's go back to that tomb. Let's go back to that darkness. In that tomb, while the stone was still there on that third day, something happened inside the darkness of that tomb. God does his best work in the darkness. Now I want to show you something in scripture that will help you understand what happened during that time in the darkness of that tomb. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter four, verse nine, now this, he ascended, ascended. Who is he? It's capital H. We know who ascended, right? Jesus. So we're talking about Jesus here. He ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one, capital O, who ascended far above all the heavens that he might feel all things. Did you see that? The one that ascended, before he ever ascended, he first descended into, into the lower parts of the earth. Now, why is that important? That is important because <clears throat> before the resurrection, when an Old Testament believer was a faithful believer and died, <clears throat> they did not go up to heaven. They went down to the center of the earth. In the story of the rich man and Lazarus, we know that they were separated by a great gulf. There was Abraham's bosom, and then there was a place called Hades or hell, eternal fire, separated by a great gulf. So in that Abraham's bosom were, was Abraham, Noah, Moses, David, Joshua, Caleb, fill in the blanks of the superheroes of the faith, okay? They're all there. But during the darkness of the tomb, it's everyone has to accept Jesus as the Messiah, okay? Not just the ones that came after the cross, everyone. So he had to reveal himself to all of those, and they had to decide to accept him as Messiah. Can you imagine him looking at Isaiah and, and, and saying to Isaiah, the prophet, those prophecies that you prophesied of the Messiah, I am him. Here's how I am. And so there's like a three-day revival meeting that happened. He descended. Why else would he descend? There's two reasons why he descended. While his body was laying in darkness, he was still working. Above, above the scenes, it looked like nothing was happening. It looked like there were not just darkness in that tomb, that they were encased in darkness. But Jesus was still working. His earthly body was laying on a stone cold slab, but God, Jesus, the word of God, 
The, the second part of the Godhead, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, the Son of God was working. He was working beneath us. He was taking care of every human being that had ever existed. He revealed himself unto all the Old Testament saints. And of course, I'm going to show you why I believe they all accepted him as the Messiah. But then he did something interesting also. The Bible said he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Come on, somebody. He broke in hell. didn't break in hell, but he kicked down the gates of hell. And he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. You know, what kind of man don't even have keys to his own house? Think about it. If I told you, if I invited you over my house for a barbecue or hang out, we're going to do chips and salsa and watch the game. And you showed up outside and I'm standing out there in my yard and you're, I'm so excited to see you, man. So thankful y'all came over tonight. Thank you for inviting us. And I just keep standing there waiting and waiting and waiting. They keep waiting. Well, we're going to go in. The game's about to start. Well, you know, I don't have keys. What do you mean you don't have keys? It's your house. Well, I, yeah, I live here, but Sandy's got the keys. Uh, she won't let me have the keys. I, I, I don't have keys in my house. So we got to wait on her to get here to let us in because I don't have keys in my own house. Well, you, just give me your man card right then. Just give me your man card because you ain't no man. What kind of man ain't got a key to his own house? And we're afraid of a devil. We're letting a devil torment us and our family. And he ain't got keys to his own house. Death, hell, and the great Jesus. So G all this is happening in the darkness. Come on, somebody. Can I get somebody to shout me down? Can I get somebody to give me some love? Give me some fist bumps. Give me some praying hands. Give me some high fives. Give me some love. Smashing the like button. If I'm preaching good, somebody just give me a shout. All this is happening in the darkness. Somebody, somebody just quote this. Somebody just put this in the comment or live chat. God works. His, God does his best work in the dark. God does his best work. Let me show you what I mean by that. Look at this right here. Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Come on, somebody. Can I tell you something? He wasn't talking about the sun there. He's talking about light. Sun is not the only thing that's lighting that gives off light. It gives off light to us. But every star gives off light. But more than anything, he gives off light. It was a transference of his glory into his creation. But did you catch it? He did it in the darkness. He did it in the darkness. God does his best work in the dark, y'all. He spoke to the darkness of nothing. And when he spoke to nothing, nothing became something. Because that's the power of light over darkness. The moment light shows up, darkness runs. We know the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. Do you know what the speed of darkness is? 186,000 miles per second. Because darkness runs away from light at the speed of light. <laughs> Woo, that's good preaching. So, in the middle, in the middle of those three days, it was dark. I want you to understand something. There's going to be a moment on Monday where it's going to be light. It's going to feel like a day. And then all of a sudden, something, listen to this. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Just look, look at a picture of the eclipse. What does it look like? It looks like a stone rolling in front of an opening. All of a sudden, this bright light has a circle that covers up the opening and seals the light. Woo! Y'all need to go watch my Eclipse show because on my Eclipse show that I did, all you got to do, is I'll direct link it down below. This is the thumbnail for it. Man, and this, this is, this is the, the show here. It's called Will the, Will the Eclipse usher in a whole new world. Y'all need to go watch that because one of the things that I show you on that is that the, the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, but it's 400 times further away from the moon than the moon is from earth. You can't make that up. 
It's, it's it, God designed for this amazing thing called a solar eclipse to happen and put the sun at such a distance and made the moon at such a circumference, perfect, that really the only one in the whole solar system that can see this is us. And on Monday, when that happens, I want you to remember, if you're watching this before Sunday, before Monday, and you are watching this eclipse, whether you are in totality or impartial, and you got your glasses on, because this you'll have your glasses on when this happens, you will begin to see a black spot come in. And it's perfectly circular. And it begins to move in different ways, depending on where you're at. It reminds me of a stone rolling in front of a tomb and sealed. For four and a half minutes, it's going to be sealed. For four and a half minutes, light will be covered. For four and a half minutes, people that are in that totality will be in darkness. But they, but they know, but they forget because they're such, they're, we're going to be in such awe of the sight, we forget that it's dark, but the most powerful physical, not spiritual, physical force in our world is just behind that darkness. The sun, S-U-N, is still shining behind the darkness. It's still working. It's just being blocked by the stone, by the moon. But Sunday's coming. Come on, somebody. But here's what I want you to know. While we are looking at the eclipse, I want us to remember. I want us to, it's, it's, our, it's our closest natural example of us being able to experience what happened back then 2,000 years ago. No, th- please don't twist this. I'm not saying it's anywhere near. Compared, it's not the resurrection. It's just a celestial sign. But it's going to cause our mind to think everything is not what it looks like. Everything is not what it seems. Because behind that stone in that tomb, after he had descended to earth, into the earth, after he had preached the gospel to the Abraham's bosom, after he had taken the keys of death, hell, and the grave, made an open show of the devil, watch this, he came back in that tomb. Now, I wasn't in that tomb. You wasn't in that tomb. Nobody was in that tomb except Jesus and maybe probably some angels. But watch this, Jesus' spirit came back into that body. He didn't get up when the stone rolled away. He stood up before the stone rolled away. I believe that. I don't have proof of that, but I believe that. Why? Because God does his best work in darkness. But it wasn't dark when he came back in. See, on the other side of that stone, if the soldiers looked at the stone, they would not have any idea that on the inside of that tomb, on the other side of that eclipse, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. It was, the sun was shining. The S-O-N was shining on the other side of that rock. He came back. The glory of God came in. Watch this. He took the time to take the napkin off his face, handkerchief off his face, and fold it up neatly and lay it where his head was which was, a, was very symbolic and a whole nother sermon in itself, which means I'm coming back. The stone was rolled away and he walked out in the darkness because Mary showed up while it was still yet dark. So he was standing out there in the dark. We know that he met Mary at some point. So he was there in the darkness. Can I tell you something? Jesus is still there, even in the darkness. And I'm telling you, there's no other physical sign that we could ever see of what happens in the darkness, how the darkness can be deceiving than what we're going to see on Monday. Because we're going to, it's going to be incredible. I hope everybody, I'm praying for the clouds to get out where I'm going. They're calling for clouds now. I'm saying in the name of Jesus, clear skies, wherever you're at. I hope you get to see it. I hope you get to experience it. 
It's an experience of a lifetime. But I'm going to tell you something. Something spiritual is going to happen because it's symbolic. First the natural, then the spiritual. God takes the natural to teach us spiritual principles. I believe with all my heart, there's no way in this world you're going to make me believe that all the things that are happening in our world, all the prophetic signs that are happening in our world just so happened that seven years ago, we had a, an eclipse that came across seven cities of Salem, which means peace. Now we have an eclipse going from the other direction across seven cities of Nineveh, and it's going to X right over little Egypt. X right over a place called rapture. You're going to tell me that all of that is happening. All the signs that are happening in Israel, the earthquakes, the rumors of wars and the wars, <clears throat> all the things that Jesus prophesied would happen in the last days. And then to top it all off, we got a solar eclipse that's four and a half minutes and a, a comet that nobody saw coming called a devil comet that's going to show up. And all of the planets are going to line up perfectly on the eighth. Come on, somebody. Go on and on and on. CERN chooses April 8th to fire up the, the, the collider, the great collider. CERN in Switzerland is firing back up on April 8th. NASA is firing rockets into the eclipse and into the darkness. Listen, they know something is coming. They know it. But the church is asleep at the wheel. And when I talk about things like this, people get in the comment section, talk about fear mongering and all this. Kind of, here he goes again. Here he goes again. Well, what are you doing, Mr. Uh, judge, judger of the, of the social media and Internet? What are you doing to wake people up to the fact that Jesus is coming soon? When I look up at that eclipse, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to be overwhelmed by it. But I'm going to think about this right here. And I'm charging you to think about it, too. I want you to think about that just like what we are seeing in the natural. That rock called the moon is going to roll in front of the sun, S-U-N. But the S-U-N is hidden, but it is still shining on the inside. And just like on the third day, the stone was rolled away. When you begin to see that eclipse lift and all of a sudden that sun starts coming back and watch this, just like the glory, no man shall see the glory and live. You, you might look at the, at the eclipse with the natural eye, but as soon as the S-U-N starts coming back in to view, you better put your glasses back on because your natural eyes cannot comprehend it. That's the glory of God. That's the type and shadow of the glory of God. See, that's why, that's why mankind likes to live in darkness, look through the eyes of darkness, because they can handle darkness. But they can't handle the light. My goodness. Have y'all enjoyed tonight? If you've enjoyed tonight, let me know in the live chat, the com especially in the comment section. Live chat goes away at some point. Watch it on Facebook. Make sure you subscribe. And listen one more time. Go out there. If you hadn't already done, I'll put it as soon as the live chat is over, live stream is over, I'll put it in the description. Go out to uh, and watch this. If you hadn't watched it, watch it again. Get ready for it. Get ready for it. It's big. Send this to people that you know and love. And, uh, and then, of course, go to our website, LarryRagland.com. Get a copy of our book. Become a partner with us. Many of you have already done that. We appreciate it so much. We're getting ready to go back on television. We'll tell you more about that as, as the days come. Uh, but, man. What a great crowd tonight for Bible study. Don't forget, Monday, listen to me. Oh, by the way, tomorrow night, tomorrow night, Thursday night, Paul Begley, y'all, will be with me here on the Kingdom Intelligence Report, and we will be talking about what he has learned about the eclipse. He'll be live from Dallas, Texas, speaking at the conference there. So don't miss that. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, Kingdom Intelligence Report with Pastor Paul Begley. And then watch this. Here it is. Here it is. Monday, April 8th, throughout the day, Pray that there's no internet outages. Pray that there's nothing going that's going to stop this because I plan on going live throughout the day. And then if I can work it out, I'm going to try to live stream the eclipse. Now, I'm not going to be holding no camera because I'm going to be enjoying it, but I'm going to try to get a camera positioned for y'all that can't be in totality, that won't destroy my camera because <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the best way to do it. And I'm going to try to live stream it uh, while it's happening. But then more importantly, uh, on that Monday night, as every Monday night, it is live at 7 o'clock Central Time. Sandy and I will be live from the state of Arkansas, 
as we broadcast live on Eclipse Day. We will be showing, excuse me, we'll be showing interviews of people that we've interviewed throughout the day, clips of things that we saw and experienced and testimonies, and then we'll cover the news of the day. But it is a big, big show. So let's load it up Monday night. Praise God. So I hope everybody enjoyed the Bible study tonight. Uh, God bless you all. I hope that all this worked because as soon as I went live, I had all kinds of computer problems. So hope it all worked. And I guess I'll find out when I go look at the live chat. And I will read everything that's in the live chat, Facebook, YouTube, and Rumble. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We always want to say thank you to our partners. Thank you all Super Chats, all the Super Thanks tonight. What a blessing you are to us. We ain't woke, but we are certainly awake. We'll see you tomorrow night with Pastor Paul Beckham.